All right, there we go. All right, thank you everyone for coming and thank you to our lovely panelists who made it out today. Um, kind of hard to be sitting inside on such a nice day, but we definitely appreciate you attendees and panelists. Um, I'll just start off with a quick introduction to what we're doing today and a quick introduction to our panelists. Um, so today, this event today is a follow-up from a webinar that we held last week um, focused on having all of our lovely panelists at different locations along Whatcom County, um, along the shorelines, talking about intertidal creatures and different projects that we have going, um, such as Olympia oyster restoration and sea star surveys. Bob Lemon tuned in from Neptune Beach last week talking about sea star surveys and also all the cool kelp and seaweed that they found on the beach. Lynn Givler is another naturalist who tuned in from the Birch Bay Point Whitehorn area, um, just looking at all the cool critters that were around this really big boulder on the beach. Um, sea stars, crabs, fish of all kinds. Um, if you're interested in learning more about anything that these people were talking about, um, feel free to check out our YouTube video um, that's up online and on our website. Um, Chris Brown tuned in from Mud Bay, which is part of North Chuckanut Bay, talking about Olympia oyster restoration, um, which Glenn, Ale Glenn Alex Alexander um, was going to tune in from, but was unable to make it that day. So they're both really great oyster experts. They also participate in several other surveys that we coordinate through the North Sound Stewards and Resources programs. So feel free to pose questions about different projects we have there. Anyway, um, so we're going to be doing a Q&A presentation today. Um, so feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A um, or otherwise, if that's not working for you, we can try the chat. Um, we have, I can start off with one question that was sent ahead of time, um, but feel free to ask anything that comes to mind. All right. So the first question that we had come in um, was asking about sand dollars. Um, one second, the Google Doc just closed. Um, question asking about sand dollars um, from Lori Bender. And it specifically asked, is it okay to take home sand dollars found during low tide in Birch Bay? Some are white and some are black. So does anyone want to explain why they're, what the difference between the black and white ones are and if it's okay to take them home? Alex? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Hear you great. So the sand dollars are uh, echinoderms, which means they have little spikes on their hard skin. And they also have tube feet, little hoses that they use to suck on. So people are pretty familiar with, with uh, sea stars, which also have little spines. If you look closely at a purple sea star, you'll see little white bumps. They're not sharp, they're just little bumps. And then on the bottom, they have their tube feet. Well, the sand dollars have the same sort of structure. And when they're alive, those, uh, those uh, things on the outside, their tube feet and their little spines appear black. And so if you see a black one, then that's a live uh, a sand dollar. Now, when they die, the, the animal decomposes a little bit and those things on the outside all fall off. And then their inside shell, which is called a test, is left behind. And that's the white part. So if you see a white sand dollar, it's already dead and then those outer things have all fallen off. But is it okay to take things home? Um, if it's a state park, it's against the law to take anything home. So that's one thing to consider, of course. If it's a, another beach, if it's a private beach or, or someplace that's not protected in that way, in my opinion, it's best not to take things home because everything there is part of the ecosystem. And the best place to appreciate it is to go to the beach and find it there, love it, look at it, pick it up, you know, do whatever, and then put it back when you're done in the appropriate place. That's my opinion. 
Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Does anyone else want to throw in their two cents on that question or should we move on to the next one? All right. Well, we're going to move on to a question from Kim Clarkin. Um, and Kim asks, we saw a lot of sand dollars at Mud Bay during low tide that were not in a bed with other sand dollars, just looking like they had been washed up individually. They still had their black legs. Everybody wanted to know, were they still alive? How can we tell? Um, don't sand dollars prefer to be in beds with their companions? Does anyone have any suggestions for what may have been going on? Chris? Well, I, I don't have the, uh, the exact answer, but the ones that, are, that we found, and I was out there with Kim, uh, isolated, uh, individually or, or two or three, in my opinion, would be that maybe some wave action, it was windy out there that day, and that at very low tide when the water was still on them, but very shallow, that some wave action could have come in and lifted them up and out of the sand and, and put them somewhere else. So, but I honestly don't know, because you do usually find them in groups. Yeah, Alex? Oh, you're muted. There we go. I was trying to get unmuted. Um, uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I've been out to Mud Bay uh, several times, and I've noticed that a lot of times the sand dollars are lying on the, on the sediment upside down. Uh, I wonder if, if Bob or Lynn if you know anything about that. I thought the, you usually see pictures of sand dollars. They're kind of standing up in the sand or they might even be right side up with their top side up and their bottom side down in the sediment. But, but it seems in Mud Bay, they're always upside down on their backs with their bottom side facing up. Any, any, any ideas about that? Um. Yeah, let me try. Um, I'm uh, a little hazy on this, but I remember reading that in different environments, uh, sand dollars will either bed on edge or flat, depending on um, where they're living and what immediate environmental conditions are around them, like how much wave action um, is present. And um, they also can vary in how deep they bury themselves. They can work down into the substrate or they just lay out on the top. Um, based on, on that, I would think that being upside down wouldn't bother them much and that they could correct it um, <laughs> later. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe they got flipped over on a windy day and maybe the next windy day they'll get flipped upright, but um, I suspect they can still get along fine. Now, yes. Alex? Yeah, yeah it, it seems to me that they're at Mud Bay, they're always upside down and all of them are. And so I was wondering if it, maybe it was a matter of the, of the sediment, maybe it's a finer mud and they don't want that on their bottom side. So they, they turn over so that they can feed without some sort of problem that may happen because of the, the type of sediment that's there. Well, it sounds like I'm going to have to find that old article, <laughs> a long lost article and uh, read it again. And maybe Mud Bay can, uh, can give us more information on that basic phenomena. Maybe it's a good topic for somebody's master's thesis. Yeah. I would disagree about they're all tipped over, Alex. I've been out there many times and there are lots of them that they're all leaning on each other uh, like a, a loaf of bread or something. The slices are all leaning. 
but I wouldn't say that, that they're all flipped over at all. And it may be um, that there's some fish or crab that comes over and kind of turns them over like uh, file cards or something uh, at the library, but, or in the old days, file cards. But, uh, um, but I've seen plenty that are in normal position in the bay there. Lynn? Yeah, I was going to suggest, I was kind of wondering if gulls were getting at them. I mean, if they're out foraging on the beach and they're trying to find like heart cockles on the surface, if it's like mistaken for something they wanted to eat and then just tossed it. But I don't know. That is just a guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, if nobody has, does anybody have anything else to add on this question? We had another one come in. Okay, another question from Lori Bender asking, all of the sea stars we saw during low tide last week at Whitehorn Point were big and beautiful and bright purple. Does that mean that the population is healthier this year? And I think that might be in reference to the sea star wasting syndrome that has affected sea stars in our area. Bob, were you working on that or is that? Michael, I mean, I can say um, we said the same thing. Anyway. Well, um, yes, I, I've been a participant in, in the Sea Star surveys that Michael is leading. And uh, I, I didn't see what you saw at Point Whitehorn, but just generally, there seems to be recovery, uh, certainly not full recovery, and some species are still uh, in quite a bit of trouble. The big sunflower star in particular um, is troubled. Uh, my personal anecdotal information from <laughs> just being on the beach or participating in surveys is that things look better now or seeing fewer diseased, but that's anecdotal. I was out at Point Whitehorn also uh, last week and saw the same thing, big plump uh, sea stars, uh, purple, sea stars, a few orange ones, but saw one, I think, that had wasting disease. 99% were in great shape. I also just put a link in the chat to a resource that collects information and data about sea stars. Um, so you can go in and explore that website to learn more about um, where people are finding healthy sea stars and sea stars affected by wasting disease. Um, it's organized in part um, with help from Melissa Miner, Randy Gautam, and Melissa Douglas, as well as Michael Kite, who helps out with the data collection here. Um, Michael Kite was one of our other panelists during the webinar last week. Does anyone else have anything they want to discuss on sea stars? I have a question that I was curious about after the webinar last week. Um, Lynn, you had mentioned, I think, towards the end of your talk about a pile of seashells under the rock. Um, did you want, was that a hint of something that you could talk about today, or is that something that we could explore? Well, Actually, that pile was from a clamor. Oh. <laughs> and you could tell, I mean, he, we saw him and you could also see, you know, where he cut the, sh cut it out of the shell. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that, it wasn't a sea star. No. Oh. Stars definitely do open clams and, you know, open them a little bit and then they take their stomach and sort of extrude it between the cracks and get around the meat inside and digest it down, so. Yeah, that was a human anthropogenic activity. 
Yeah, I know some animals can really eat a lot of seashelled creatures and can like accumulate these middens or like piles of seashells. So I wasn't sure if there is something in particular that you were excited to talk about. I fooled you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you got me curious. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or Q&A right now, so I guess. Um, if you have any questions for each other based on your, oh, we have another one come in from Kim asking or saying, I've heard jellyfish are increasing in, in the ocean in general. Is that happening in the Salish Sea too? So has anyone noticed an increase in jellyfish in the water or know what kind of impacts that could have on the ecosystem? Not sure. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can find. Um, but another question I had um, was regarding the fish that you saw under the rock at Point Whitehornland. Do you know what that is or have you looked into it at all? Well, yeah, actually Diane, who was out with me she emailed me and she looked it up. It's a plain fin midshipman, which strangely enough, you know, all the years I've been at beaches, I had actually never seen one. And I know um, Casey was really familiar with them, but apparently this was a male that was probably under the rock guarding eggs. Um, and I read somewhere that they can get into such big numbers that they actually become an issue for people that are fishing, they get caught up in huge numbers in their nets, but it, it was a new one to me. Have any of the rest of you experienced? <laughs> Looks like there's a couple people who want to comment. Yeah. yeah About I, Mud Bay. I've had experiences with the midshipmen too. Um, in fact, uh, I'm also helping citizen volunteers who want to be beach naturalists for visitors to the state parks at, uh, at Birch Bay and at Larrabee. And I had some new volunteers down there this last weekend and uh, helping them get started and, and, and to feel comfortable with the task. And one of them came in and had a picture on her phone of something that she had found and she didn't know what it was. And uh, I looked at it and immediately knew that they were midshipmen eggs. And the, the midshipmen, now the rock that, that you, where you saw it, Lynn, was a great big, huge rock and nobody could possibly turn that over. But the midshipmen also get under smaller rocks and um, rocks that are small enough for people to turn over. And so, I tell the people at the state park beach and I have, and I train these volunteers to tell people that we don't turn over rocks that are bigger than your head. And one of the reasons is that those rocks that are slightly bigger than that uh, will sometimes have the midshipmen under them. It's the male midshipman that uh, guards the eggs, that makes the nest and guards the eggs until they hatch. And in this case, it looked like at a previous low tide, someone had turned over the rock. Perhaps they saw the fish and, and maybe they didn't even see the eggs. I don't know what they thought, but sometimes when visitors turn over a rock and find a big fish under there, they think, oh my gosh, this fish is stranded. It, it, I have to help it by putting it back in the water. So they take the fish and put it out in the, in the water that could be, because the tide is out, it could be far away. Well, when this volunteer found this rock like that with the eggs exposed, there was no fish around anywhere. So I assume that uh, someone uh, had disturbed the nest at an earlier time. And that's why we have that rule, please don't turn over rocks that are bigger than your head. Another thing about the midshipmen is that they have these bright shiny dots down their front, which is how they get their name because midshipmen on the, uh, in the Navy, in, in the British Navy, they have these uh, bright shiny buttons down their front. 
and uh, these midshipmen have those little dots. And interestingly enough, they are bioluminescent, so they glow in the dark. I've also heard that uh, midshipmen, I haven't ever heard them do this, but I hear that they grunt and people that live in houseboats in, in Seattle and in other places are sometimes disturbed by the loud grunting from the midshipmen. Wow, interesting. Um, I would Hoffman, add, oh, excuse Hoffman me, Ron. A question um, asking Chris, or we could just extend it to um, the other panelists as well, um, but asking if midshipmen are found under smaller rocks as opposed to some of the larger ones. Head sized is what does Alex mentioned, the ones that I've found them under. I was going to say that out at Mud Bay, the north end of Chuckanut Bay, around the corner from the trestle there in the riprap, we found as many as five of those egg nests with the males in them one summer, a number of years ago. Um, and I'm anticipating probably seeing some in another 10 days or so. We're going back out there to do green crab surveys. But um, they're, they're fascinating fish. Uh, the males, as Alex said, settle down in a depression with the rock overhead. And I only can imagine that the female comes in and lays eggs upside down or something to that effect on, on the uh, rock that's overhead. And they do grunt. I, I've touched one or two of these fish and just put my index finger on its head and it did make a grunt um, and so did I. But um, other than that, they're beautiful. And as Alex said, they have these bioluminescent dots all the way up and down there. They're, they're ventral side and uh, they have a very large head and a very tapering narrow tail. Very, uh, very, a lot of fun to, to find, but turn that rock back over carefully. Thanks for the addition. Um, we have a couple questions from Josh Becker, also about the midshipmen. One asking, what benefit does the bioluminescence give them and why do they grunt? Whoa. Bob, do you want to tune in? Yeah, I'll try that one. Um, when I, uh, first of all, I'll uh, add something to the grunting. Uh, that's how I use, that's the uh, method I use to find a midshipman. So I'm going along a beach. Um, and finding interesting things and, well, what's that sound I hear? Hmm, where's it coming from? And track it down and, and, and I find a midshipman. Um, it's kind of um, extended grunting, like that. I don't know if anybody heard that. Uh, <laughs> So uh, what's the bioluminescence for? Well, these are uh, essentially very deep water fish. They live where it's dark. And the bioluminescence uh, serves some purpose down there. And they come into the shallows, real shallows, uh, um, intertidal, just for the uh, egg laying and then they retreat to, to deeper water for the rest of their life. So um, I could make a couple, any one of us could make some, uh, let's see, we have four panelists. Uh, I bet there are four ideas about what the bioluminescence might serve. Uh, my hunch is it's, uh, species recognition. So they don't uh, try and consume their own species. Interesting. Um, Josh put in a suggestion at the end after the question saying um, that they found the photophores are for attracting prey, perhaps. 
Yes, <laughs> perhaps. Lori Bender um, put in a mention that um, the advice for not turning over rocks was helpful. Um, they're new to the Pacific Northwest and any additional etiquette rules are very much appreciated. Um, we have a page on the website and I'll provide a link on for the website in a minute. Um, but we have a few beach etiquette recommendations and there's even more in our videos page on the website. So please check that out. Um, and you can also look um, to resources.org for more information too. And I can provide links for that as well. Um, does anyone want to provide more input on the midshipmen or can we move on to another question? Um, I also put a link to some information about midshipmen in the chat, as well as a link to some information about jellyfish that might help answer Kim's question. Um, I kind of skimmed the website and it sounds like there might be some increase in jellyfish in the Sailor Sea, um, particularly coinciding with warm water events. Um, Josh Becker put in another question, noting that jellyfish can be sucked into boat intake valves. Um, oh, looks like this might just be a comment, um, but if they're sucked into boat intake valves, um, if they make it into the engine, they can cause problems. Um, Josh Becker also put another comment in the chat saying that barnacles provide grip when avoiding mud or seaweed it's not polite to use them for traction. So that's, Lori, um, another good beach etiquette um, piece of advice. Um, we try not to step on creatures of any kind when we're out on the beach, um, being aware of kind of what's maybe underneath the seaweed too, um, which can make it a little hard to get around on the beach. But if we're trying to be kind to the creatures, it's a good thing to keep in mind. So let's see. Any other questions coming in? Perhaps we need to take a little moment to think about something. Um, I'll ask a question. Yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, oh, to the other panelists. And um, so uh, it's back to uh, the uh, sand dollars. Um, anecdotally, it seems to me like Mud Bay sand dollar beds have increased tremendously uh, in the time that I've been frequenting that place. And the uh, same is true for the bed um, at Marine Park. It seems to me like that used to be uh, much smaller and now much bigger. And I wonder if, and I don't remember other than Point Roberts, I don't recall other sand dollar beds. So um, what are other people's, uh, other beachcombers uh, observations relative to uh, the possible increase of sand dollars? Well, I, I don't have any uh, observation about increasing or decreasing, but um, the thing that I've noticed out in Mud Bay, and I've all, also noticed to the south of there down at a private beach that I am a member of, they also there are also sand dollars down there, um, not in the quantity that they are up in Mud Bay. And I've noticed that they'll, you'll find large patches of dark ones, the living ones. And then as you walk across the flats, you'll find large patches of dead ones. And I've never quite understood. They all seem to die off together uh, or something. I don't know. Uh, it's like one large sand dollar cemetery or something. And then there are large populations in, you know, right nearby. And uh, I've never quite understood that, never seen anything about it. Just a comment. 
Well, I have a cut. I don't know anything about that either, but I do have a couple of uh, thoughts about that. One is it could be a disease if they if it transmits from individual to individual. I suppose it could knock out a part of the population. But it's also true that moving water sorts things by mass and size. So for instance, if when you go to the beach, you'll find all the rocks that are about three inches in diameter are over here and the sand is over there and, and, and they're, they're sorted by size. And uh, when you pan for gold, you move the water in the pan so that the, the heavier gold is separated out from the lighter sand. And so it's also possible, I suppose, that the dead um, uh, sand dollars from a place where they're uh, healthy might get sorted out because of those differences in, in, uh, in density or just an idea. And I wouldn't know how to answer that either, but I was going to say another place where there are extensive beds are um, the boundary base side of Semiamu Spit. And frankly, I don't know if they've increased or decreased there, but if people are interested in sand dollars, there's another, another spot. Yeah, Any other questions from and for panelists? I guess I'll ask another question. Um, Bob, what is your favorite kind of kelp or seaweed? Or is that too hard of a question? Uh, it's hard only because there are quite a few favorites. It's, um, you know, among good things, um, you know, I could probably ask you something about your favorite, I don't know, <laughs> and you'd be stumped because there are four of them. So, um, uh, okay, well, one of my favorites. Um, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it here, but uh, yeah, I should have brought my algae collection and then I could hold up. The, um, Delasiria disipens uh, is a red algae that, a red alga, that's singular, um, that has very thin, delicate blades with many more thin, delicate blades coming off of uh, um, a central axis. Uh, there's no way to describe that, but a name like Delasiria disipens, that just rings so true. It, it, it's, uh, it fits. And unfortunately, the taxonomists have recently changed the name, yeah. but uh, they didn't change the way I view it. Uh, Della Syria Disciples is, is the best of the best. Uh, another favorite and another grumble about name changes in the uh, earlier days of scientific uh, uh, discovery when people were putting official names on uh, various algal forms that they found. They uh, often used descriptive, Latinized descriptive names. And there is, uh, in, in our waters here, it's actually abundant in our waters, um, an alga that is iridescent. It, it, it um, has this remarkable iridescent quality in addition to being kind of rubbery and stretchy. Um, so 
early scientists kindly named it Iridea. That's the Latin name, Iridea. Splendens. Well, what could be better uh, to describe an iridescent, splendid alga? Um, unfortunately, that one <laughs> has recently been changed. Uh, the name changed, but the uh, uh, alga didn't change, and I can still include it as a favorite. So you'll have to come to the beach and, uh, <laughs> to share the images. Well, thanks, Bob. I'll definitely look into some of those. They sound really cool. Um, looks like we have another question from Kim. Um, Kim says, I remember a couple years where we saw lots of nudibranchs at beach at the beach on the beach at Point Whitehorn, I think in June. Is this an annual event? Spawning, end of life? Um, does anyone have any insight as to why you might see them in June? Yes. Um, it's uh, part of the reproductive cycle. What we were seeing uh, was um, dying adults, post-mating dying adults, that they uh, spend nearly all their life in the subtital, slight, just shallow subtitle, 20 feet or so deep. Um, and uh, um, they live maybe two or three years, but every, uh, every spring there's a, a mating event and uh, both the male and female expire after that and leave eggs uh, to uh, uh, survive on their own. And the next generation comes along. These uh, events where the, where the uh, dying uh, recently mated adults uh, come up on shore, um, when the currents and winds are just right at the right time, that can happen at most any place where they, uh, they live in the nearby subtitle. And it's been recorded um, from other locations. It just was really good fortune that one year right during the uh, um, what's the point program, why that year these nudibranchs washed up on the shore just in time for what's the point. Uh, we certainly can't count on it. And there's an article in the, uh, um, in the Shell Club newsletter um, addressing this. So we had another question come in from Diane Hollins asking what type of nudibranch would be there? So maybe what were you seeing on that big, <laughs> that big what's the point event? Or what would you as naturalists kind of expect to see in that area? Uh, that was just one species. The name escapes me right now. Uh, Linda Schrader would be able to answer in an instant. Uh, I should know, but I don't remember. But we have three other panelists here that might remember what that was. Nope. I wasn't there that year. <laughs> OK, well, then it's going to be dope slap. When I leave this panel, I will remember it as I walk out the room. <laughs> well, Bob, Sorry. if you think about it, you can send it over to me, and I can include <laughs> that in the um, attendee follow-up email. Um, one question that come that came in from Josh asked, what are your favorite beaches? Um, any and all of y'all can answer this one. 
I'm sure you have some favorites that you like to visit for different things. Alex? Yeah, I worked in my career for nearly 30 years at Padilla Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And so I became very familiar with that beach, with those mud flats. I really like mud flats now. I like the smell. I like uh, the way that it all, all the blades lie out in straight lines as the tide comes in or out. I'm impressed by the flowers and the, uh, uh, and the epiphytes, the plants and animals that attach to the blades and that live under the blades. I remember walking through uh, the eelgrass meadow at Padilla Bay when the tide was way out, but the, uh, the vegetation was so thick that there was still six to 12 inches of water that was captured there. And as I sloshed through the eelgrass, there were fish jumping out in front of me, probably uh, um, uh, 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 spine sticklebacks or, no, it wasn't that, it was uh, those bigger ones. Um, I, I'm, I'm forgetting the name now, these long straight fish about uh, eight to 12 inches long were jumping out in front of me like flying fish. And, and these experiences that I've had out there, the, when it's sunny and if it's not windy, the photosynthesis is so intense that the, the blades of the grass are giving off their oxygen and, and you can actually hear it uh, bubbling and, and sizzling and hissing because the photosynthesis is so amazing. I just, I could go on and on. I'll let others share. <laughs> Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, um, I'm sort of a fan of rocky beaches <laughs> and especially ones that are more exposed. And although I haven't been there for years, there's a beach on um, the west coast of Vancouver Island, the West Coast Trail, and it's areas of just solid bedrock that you walk along and there's tide pools all over the place. It's almost like having a, a highway you can walk on, but as you get closer to the water, then you start to see all these amazing animals, all the encrusting coral and algae and, you know. Anyway, that's a very cool place. Right now we can't get there because the border is closed, but highly recommend it. Bob, you must have a favorite beach. Uh, do you want me to? Okay, I'll go ahead. Um, I think uh, uh, like favorite algae, uh, favorite beach. Um, every uh, kind of beach has its own special qualities. And um, whether it's a, a mud bay or a, a cobble substrate or sand or bedrock, they're all unique. And uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, is, uh, just like a, a, a desert is fascinating and so is a rainforest and so are all the other kinds of terrestrial vegetation uh, types that we we can experience and learn about and and uh, immerse ourselves in. Uh, uh, so uh, beaches, hard to pick a favorite. I think cobble may have the most diversity because there are so many different kinds of living spaces in a cobble beach. Uh, a, a lot of uh, animals can burrow down and uh, uh, into the substrate in addition to living on surfaces. And, uh, and algae can, has lots of solid uh, uh, spots to attach itself. 
Um, their um, algae can also be free floating. So um, they all have uh, uh, their own special attractions. Thanks. I would say that that uh, my favorite beach is any one that I can be on at the time of low tide, be it a rocky or a sandy mud base full of mud, uh, eelgrass areas like Alex was saying. It's just great to get out there and explore. As Bob was saying, there's so much diversity out there. Chris, you and I uh, share going out to Mud Bay for the green crab surveys. And, and so to have an excuse like that, to go back to the same beach over and over and over and over again, really adds to the enjoyment for me. Uh, for instance, there's that rock out there that has those lilies. Is it the chocolate lily? Yeah. Yeah. And they're only blooming there for a short time. And, and I just, uh, I just, you know, every time I go by that rock, I look up, oh, I, are the chocolate I, lilies there now? I do too. And I usually miss them. They're, yeah. they're dry and everything. Yeah. It's, and then the Canada uh, geese that there's one that usually nests up on top of one of those pillar rocks and, uh, and there are a variety of things. And then out there at Mud Bay, the trestle itself, man-made uh, man uh, entity there. And there are dozens and dozens of purple sea stars just hugging those concrete pilings. And they're going after the barnacles. There are nudibranchs, the, the lemon peel nudibranchs out there. And then around the corner on the riprap, another man-made uh, created uh, situation for the railroad tracks overhead, finding the, the midshipmen and a variety of things. Bob, I used to go out and follow Bob Lemon around and, and it'd be time to go. And he was still out there looking at things. It's just, uh, you could go on and on. And then you're right, the same place but different time of the season and uh, different tide levels and that sort of thing. All right, well, looks like we're getting a little close to the end of the event towards 7.30. Um, Kim Clarkin put a note in the chat um, that the dredgings from the Shell Club newsletter calls those new to Brinks, I think it was in reference to Diane's question asking what you can find at Point Whiteboard, um, calling them the Rainbow Dendronoctus. Um, and their scientific name was Dendrono Dendronotus iris. Forgive me for any <laughs> mispronunciation of that. You must um, be Latin. Um, I just an anecdote Doug Stark and I went out to White, Whitehorn. Point, uh, as I said last week, and we found one of those in the sand, sandy area. Beautiful. Lovely. Wow. Uh, I guess that maybe this could be an annual event. <laughs> Just a single one. It's the only Nudibranch yeah. event. Yeah. But by June, which is, oh, Today is June. Well, um, try tomorrow. Maybe maybe there'll be six of them on the beach. Yeah. Tomorrow. We also found a uh, Lewis moon snail, which I see I see one of those about once every twenty five years. You did find a a moon snail last week. Or? Yes, Doug Doug did again in the sand. Um, coming from the boat ramp. Wow. Those used to be very abundant there. I, I guess that's, that's another question. What's happened to them? Because we used to visit friends there and we'd find them all over the I, place. I heard that, yeah. Not this time. 
All right. Well, I want to want to save another minute um, for any last questions that might come in. Um, if anyone has questions after the event, um, or if you just can't get to that last question, um, feel free to send it to me over email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat um, and we can see if we can get those questions answered later. Um, but any last questions for like a lightning round or any last kind of easy question for us to end on? Let me just put my email in chat. Well, while people are thinking of their questions, I just want to say that the participants asked some really marvelous questions and, and inspired, I think, some uh, a fabulous answers, too, that, that uh, just really delight me. So thank you all, the, the uh, panelists and, and the participants both. I learned something. Oh, me too. Yeah, I think that's, you know, what we hope for, for events like this. Um, what's the point and anything that we hold, you know, to educate the public and answer questions and learn about intertidal creatures. Um, not seeing any questions come in, but Kim says, thank you. This was really fun. Um, and I just want to wrap up by um, mentioning that, you know, I put some links in the chat. Um, linking to our website, um, linking to some resources that I can share out in um, a follow-up email. And I also dropped my personal email for work in the chat. So if you have follow-up questions or want to learn more about anything that we've discussed and or want another link to the website, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and I forgot to introduce myself at the start, but I'm Rondi. I am the Aquatic Reserves Coordinator with Resources. Um, and I help coordinate a lot of different projects, um, like community science projects and events like What's the Point this year? Um, but thank you to everyone that tuned in today. Um, and thank you so much to our lovely panelists. It's been a real pleasure getting to hear your insights and your thoughts and your questions as well, too. Um, been really lovely and I'm glad that we were able to host this this year. Josh says thank you for your time I enjoyed learning about some new critters and beaches. So I think we're at 729 so I think we're good to get heading out but again big thanks to everyone who tuned in um, and I hope you have a really great rest of your evening enjoy the nice weather yeah big thank you for tuning in. But, Rondi, thanks for putting this all together. You're great. Yeah. As yeah, of course. All right. Gonna end the recording and we can get